any great chef the vast majority of them I think both of us started kind of on the bottom a um, little bit different realms um, I started washing dishes uh, when I was 15 years old at Coney Island in New Baltimore Michigan so a little bit, a little bit northeast of here um, you know kind of worked there for a couple of years went and uh, worked with uh, with my uncle who's also a chef uh, my uncle Mike Keys worked for him for probably like six years or so. Um, he taught me a whole lot of things. Whether you know, started I started off kind of washing dishes at his restaurant, and then kind of worked my way up. And by the time I, I left working with him, I was kind of managing the kitchen with him. And, um, went to culinary school right out of high school. Never worked in a uh, any other business a single day in my life, which is sometimes kind of unnerving to me. But you know, it's like it's what I do, so I'm okay with it. Um, but yeah, just worked. Through you know through several different great kitchens in, in this in this area, I uh, learned a lot from a, a lot of good chefs that have kind of since moved on and went different ways. But uh, you know worked uh, started working for a townhouse in Birmingham in 2014, I think, and uh, jumped on board with that restaurant group. And we've since opened Townhouse Detroit and now Prime and Proper, um, which you know got to meet this big guy. So yeah. it's been uh, it's been a fun ride. So. That's awesome. And what about you, Walter? What's uh, what's the origin story behind how you came to Detroit? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm born and raised Jersey boy, uh, right on the Jersey Shore. And as you see, I don't sound like those people from the Jersey Shore, even though I grew up right where they filmed all that. Uh, I, I grew up in an all German household, and uh, it was, you know, we don't go to grocery stores. You go to butcher shops, and you go to the fishmonger, you go to the bread guy for bread and cheese. You know, it was like an all day excursion. You know with my parents and uh, just getting to eat like that and seeing all the, the passion and love for, you know, people that do what they do best. And uh, just growing up at the butcher shop right down the corner and spending all my time in the shop, you know, from elementary school up. And literally it's the only thing I've ever done is just I've always been around beef, you know, and the guy that I was learning from was, you know, like here, you're gonna learn everything you know, from the bottom up, you know, and it was like, here, you're going to, you're going to go help birth a pig and birth cows. And it was like, oh, this is gross. And, you know, and, but it was like, it was important to learn the entire process, you know, from, from birth to, you know, to, to raising them, to harvesting them, to breaking them down completely, utilizing everything. And then probably the most important thing I learned was, was how, how to talk to people and trying to understand what they were looking for. You know, a lot of people nowadays, it's like, oh, New York strips and ribeyes. And, you know, I'm like, well, there's, the animal's huge. There's so much more meat. So trying to understand where, what, what are you making? You know, what, what are you going to be doing? You know, maybe the ribeye's not the right pick for you. You know, maybe the chuck end isn't. Maybe an eye round is right for you. So it was all of learning how to make people comfortable with me so that you trusted me. You know, you would come and see, and it was important for me to learn old world butchery, and that was old world butchery, is everybody trusted the butcher. You know, you trust your fish guy, you trust your bread guy. So trust was a big thing. So he had taught me all of this, and then started literally pimping me out to all the place, all butcher shops throughout New York, all throughout the city, Connecticut, that whole tri-state area. And then uh, one day I finally was, uh, my buddy was like, hey, I need help at a restaurant. And I'm like, sure. And I worked a day in a restaurant, and in the butcher shop and I was like, are you kidding me? This is awesome. And it was, and then 
probably a year or two after that, then I moved right into the restaurants and haven't looked back. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like to say I'm a restaurant guy because I'm not. I've not worked a day in my life on the line. I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that's going to be a tool in his toolbox. So that's what I've told all the chefs is use me as a tool. You know, I'm here to make your job easier, make your job better, to help, you know, help the brand shine, help the chef shine. You know, I'm not really uh, one for the spotlight. I'd rather give the spotlight to this guy or the brand, you know, by, by providing the best. I've, I've heard you talk about your, like, I like that you refer to it as an origin story, too. It's kind of funny, but, like, I've heard you talk about all of your experiences before, but you just managed to roll birthing cattle and being pimped out, like, into your origin <laughs> story. I love it. Uh, <laughs> you guys eat. Once you get them going. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm not even going yet, you know. This is, uh, I'm like, i got to feel you guys out. i got to see where you're at before I can, like, before you get all of Walter, you know. This is, uh, it's. It's a lot, you know, but I mean, pretty much that's where it was, and it, it was important. The guy was like, make sure you go to culinary school, so CIA in upstate New York. I got a chance to go work overseas for several years, which was awesome, out of Hamburg, Germany, and just get to see all of, uh, a lot of Africa, a lot of the Middle East, a lot of uh, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, you know, and it, it was great. It was, it was a lot of fun, and I just butchered. That's all I did, and it was a lot of butchery, a lot of fishmongery. I got to uh, actually spend a lot of time making cheese, which was pretty cool. I got to step away from meat for about a year and just make cheese, which was really cool, you know, but it was still, you know, being part of, you know, the dairy program, getting the dairy to make the cheese and getting to see the dairy cows in Italy. So it was, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun, you know, and now I'm here with this guy. Walter, I, I want to uh, uh, pause for a second on a point you made. So you went to the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, and you also mentioned something before that, that you're not really like a restaurant guy. But yeah. when you think of the CIA, uh, not the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, um, you think more chefs, folks that are actually going okay. into the restaurant business. I think I read that you were the only butcher in your class at the CIA. That I, that I knew of. Yeah. And it was horrible, man. My, my, the guy that I learned how to cut meat from, he was like, oh, this is where you're going. Little did I know that when we got into meat ID and meat fabrication that he, they knew each other. I had no idea. So I'm, he's like, listen, you're going to go and you're going to go blind. You're just going to learn. And I'm like, sure. So I'm in the back of the classroom. And he's just like, oh, Walter, come show us how to do this. And I'm like, well, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like, how do you know I what? <laughs> and he's like, so it was, it was interesting. So I spend a, a lot of my time just being part of the meat class. Even when we were done with meat fab, I was, I was always there helping, you know, helping teach kids. But it was also great to learn, like, with young guys like, like Ryan, you know, getting to see these kids and, this is the future that they're going and it's like get to see their minds work and it's like okay this is where they want to go and what can I do to help that and, and it was awesome get to spend a lot of time with some young chefs god back in the 90s I've been refrigerated all my life so I, I've, I've been kept, kept my youthful my youthful look I'm going to be 44 in a month that's a secret is spending yeah. time in a refrigerator <laughs> no sunlight yeah. just You've refrigeration yeah <laughs> You know, the so. Walter Apfelbaum beauty regimen. Exactly. Right here, yeah. The trademark. Just spend time gets out. with me. Yeah. You know, lamb but, fat. Lamb yeah, fat. Lamb fat. Oh man, yeah. lamb fat is like the key <laughs> to life. I tell everybody that I'm like you. You literally look at ingredients for, uh, for hand hand moisturizers, skin lotions, and the number one ingredient is lanolin and lamb fat. Most of it is lanolin. So. When everybody's like, they shake my hand, they're like, oh my God, Walter, your hands are so soft. And they're like, what do you use? And I'm like, lanolin, you know? <laughs> and it's awesome. And it's good. I mean, I put it on my lips a little bit, it makes them soft. <laughs> my wife hates it. She'll come and give me a kiss and she's like, oh my God, what is that? She's like, stop, it's gross. And I'm like, eh, it's lamb fat, don't worry about it. It's healthy. It's natural. Yeah, you know? Uh, what, what took you then from, you know, again, the Jersey Shore, the CIA, over all over Europe, Africa, Middle East, etc. Uh, I know you were in Florida most recently. Yep. Um, what brought you to Detroit, and then what was the story of how both of you connected uh, to kind of come together, private and proper? Uh, I actually got hired the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Uh, I was working for in Florida before I started working with them. Uh, they were getting. They were in partnership with uh, the Steinbrenners that own the Yankees, and he. All the Yankees do all their training in Tampa, Florida, so they all live in Tampa. So, they were working on their steakhouse in Tampa, Council Oak, and uh, they were also working with the Steinbrenners to be building NYY Steak in Yankee Stadium. 
and they were like, listen, we got these guys that don't know what they're doing in the butcher shop at Council Oak in Tampa, you know, we need to find somebody. And it was the coolest thing that all of a sudden here come the Seminole tribe leaders knocking on my door going, hey, come to Florida, you know, and I'm like, it's too hot, you know. But I wound up in Florida for nine years doing all their Council Oaks in Tampa, Hollywood, and then NYY Steak in Coconut Creek, uh, Midtown Manhattan, Yankee Stadium. So I did all theirs. And then next thing I know, our owner, Jeremy Sassone, uh, reached out via Instagram, you know, and I'm just like, I don't know who this guy is. I get all these messages. Some weird creepo guy is like messaging me and I'm like, ah, oh, what is this guy doing? You know, so I finally answered him and then we talked and he's just like, yeah, you should come up. And I'm like, well, where are you at? You know, this is such a great idea. I love what your, your concept, everything about it. And he's like, I'm in Detroit. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm like, you know, outside of Detroit, you don't, you don't, they don't talk about this. You know, and I'm like, man, I, I don't know, it's Detroit. There's no way I'm gonna convince my wife to move to Detroit. My father was gonna murder me. You're not gonna see me ever again. And then uh, he's like, no, let's fly up. So he flew me up here and literally he brought me right downtown and I was like flashbacks of 1980s New York, you know? And I'm like, this is amazing. I was like, this is New York all over again for me. You know, being a child and watching New York grow to what it is now, like Brooklyn, good luck buying anything in Brooklyn, you know, Manhattan, downtown. It's amazing. It's the, the street life, the, the whole vibe of New York is incredible. And I remember when it wasn't, I remember when it was just like, hurry up, get in, get out, you know? And it was, it, it was not the, the best place to be. And uh, I remember watching just New York come up to where it is now. So when I got here, I was like, holy mackerel, this is New York. This is, this is New York in the eighties, you know? And I was like, this is amazing. I couldn't believe the construction and the people the whole vibe. And then I told him that night, I'm like, I'm totally down. Where do, where do I sign? You know, I'm down. I, I literally, my words to Jeremy was, you're building Peter Lugers. I was like, that's what you're doing. You're building an institution that you can't put a price tag on. You know, you're, you're, I would love to be the guy that goes, I opened Peter Lugers. I opened Keens. You know, I opened Delmonico's. I can't, but prime and proper. Yeah. In Detroit. Yeah. This is, this is amazing. It's great to be to be part of Detroit's up and coming and being where it needs to be, you know, putting right back on that pedestal of just being an amazing city to, to be part of, you know. And Jeremy on that first trip took you to Eastern Market, as I understand. So <laughs> that's the, the tie in to, oh, yeah. you know, you mentioned the early, early days in the Jersey Shore going to the fishmonger and the butcher yeah. and things like that. So the, a nice tie in to oh, bring that pizza, all full man. circle. Yeah. He brought me to uh, Sapino's. It was the first thing we had. We had subpoenas, and I was like, he's like, he's like, you're from Jersey. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and we went into subpoenas, and I was like, holy crap. I'm like, okay, this is Detroit pizza? Yep. I'm, I'm down. You know, and get some good pizza, get some good beers. I'm down. Absolutely. So with Prime and Property, Prime and Proper, excuse me, um, you guys have stated that kind of part of your mission is to bring back the classic American steakhouse, but to update it with modern features. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys came together, where that concept came from, and really like what that actually means? What, what can folks ex expect if they haven't been the prime and proper yet? Uh, you know, the, a lot of, like Walter, we can kind of speak about, you know, like Keynes, Peter Lugers, um, you know, these are meccas of, of kind of steakhouses. Um, you know, and there's not a lot of places like that that still exist um, or that are continuing to kind of open. Um, you know, we were kind of like Jeremy and, and I had met a bunch of times with, uh, with Walter and kind of come up, we had the concept in line and then we kind of convinced him to come on board and we, you know, as we, as we kind of got the ball rolling for the whole concept, it just became like more and more kind of extravagant. And, uh, you know, like Walter said, like trying to become kind of an institution. Um, you know, there's a lot of places that open up and they, you know, like a lot of great restaurants downtown that maybe open and their concept is a little more trendy, a little more kind of of the minute. Um, you know, we kind of went the other direction. Like let's, let's take, you know, let's take creamed spinach or something like that, or let's take a classic, you know, steakhouse dish and make it up to date and make it on par with those kind of restaurants and um, you know really put our, our thought into it like as chefs and like as butchers and 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 bring it into you know 2018 and and 
and you know so on from there so yeah and you guys have mentioned you're not in the restaurant business you're in the experience business so you take this concept of a more classic steakhouse what's the experience you guys are going for then within kind of the bookends of that like a, a peter luger's or a keen's or something like that so kind of like walt was saying about you know tailoring the experience to each person you know like you go to talk to the butcher and you say that you like a certain type of steak but maybe as the butcher talks to you and finds out different things about what you actually enjoy to eat, you might be, he might point you in a different direction. Um, you know, when we say we're in the experience business, we're not, we're not in it to make just great food or great drinks or have great service. Um, it's all those sort of, and then some, um, you know, trying to bring it all together and, and you don't necessarily think of, wow, I had a great meal at Prime and Proper or wow, I had great, great service. Great memory. Yeah, I had like, you know, I had a great something memory. Something I want you to remember. Yeah. You know, it's not like going to a place and going, yeah, I'm going to have the filet. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, a filet, really? It's like, well, come talk to me. You know, and it's, and it's about trying to educate people without letting them know that you're educating them. You know, you don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. You want to make, you know, I'm, I'm not, tr I'm trying to educate you, but I'm tr also trying to figure you out. You know, I'm trying to, trying to read you to see where you're at because so many people are like, filet uncomfortable you know and it's like it's like okay great you know a filet but you know let me let me see what else you know talk to me like how do you like your steaks cooked you know what flavors are you looking for what textures are you looking for you know because I'm not just about to sell you a steak I want to make sure I'm selling you that experience I'm selling you a memory and I want to make sure that it's everything it's just not my steak it's going to be what Ryan's making it's it's what's going along with it you know, it's, you're talking about a filet, something that's dime a dozen compared to what's in my case. And you look at my case and you're looking at USDA prime beef that's dry aged in house. You know, it's one and a half percent of the beef in the nation. So do you really want dime a dozen or do you want one and a half percent of the beef in the nation? You know, so it's an experience, you know, and I get people that want filets and if that's what you want. then that's what you want. You know, and it, it's hopefully next time you come in that you take my advice and it's like, it's like have that New York strip. You know, and then next time you come and have the bone in New York Strip, you know, and just work your way up. I know I don't expect someone to go from from well done to rare in one sitting. You know, I want baby steps. You know, I want to I want to create a, I want to create a family with you. You know, this is I want you to be part of my family. I want you to understand. I want you to to believe in me. I want you to believe in the chef, believe in our staff, you know, make sure that you know that we're going to make sure that we're giving you the best of the best. I, uh, you, you led me perfectly, Walter, because I have a question about um, some of the values that your restaurant runs on. And I think it's really interesting because we're sitting at a company like Google. We have some friends here from Olympia. Um, again, this concept of you are a restaurant, but you're more about experiences and memories. And also you talk a lot about customer experiences as well. So on your website, you've got five prime values and I'm gonna read them out just so everyone uh, has them. So consistently care about the smallest details love all people with enlightened hospitality, own it with pride, willingness to learn and teach, and believe in everything you say and do. Which I think is really interesting. I've never seen on a restaurant's website the values that they kind of command by. Where do these come from and, and how do you guys apply those to kind of the, this concept that you've already talked about? Well, we live it. You know, this is, this yeah. is when Jeremy sat down with all, we, we all sat in a room with the, the core people that we opened up with. You know, it was like Jeremy pretty much was like, you know, like took our our personal beliefs and just was like, here, boom, it's it's this is this is what you believe in, this is what I believe in, and we're gonna make it happen. And you know, when you when you bring people like Ryan and myself and Liz and you know, and Sharon, our pastry chef, and you know, these are all people that that exude, you know enlightened hospitality you know i want to i want to teach you i want to learn from you i'm always like what's going on you know what can i learn you know and it's 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 amazing what i can learn what i can teach you know i'll sit there and i'll just like hover over ryan or i just i'll like i'll piss him off because i'm just be like hey we need to get this hey we need to get this and i'll bother him for like a month be like hey we need to get this and then he does and he's just like oh yeah and i'm like yeah you see and then he'll do the same thing to me and i'm like oh yeah look at that i never even knew that yeah. You know, so it, it's uh, it's something that we wake up with, man. We go to sleep with, we wake up with, and it's it's who we are as people. Those are like, too, those are, that's how we've built the team that we have. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily hire 
just solely on experience. I mean, yeah, it plays a big part of it, but the vast majority of why we hire people is, is if they fit those values. Um, I'd, 10 times out of 10, I'd rather take somebody that may not have as much experience, um, but that really has that drive to learn and just wants to come into the restaurant. And you know, we, we've got people that, have worked, that work in our kitchen that have been executive chefs, that have been sous chefs, chef de cuisines, um, and then we have people that have worked their way up from dishwasher position. Um, you know, and they're this great mix. And the reason that they all work so well together, uh, and that we're you know we're able to leave the restaurant and come and do something like this, and it's you know someone's experience is going to be just as great tonight if we were in the building, um, you know, because these people all collaborate together and all willing to learn from each other. Um, you know, even the executive chef might learn something from somebody that was a steward at somewhere else that maybe he has he's been doing something one way for ten years, and all of a sudden he turns around and you know the steward's doing something that like completely you know flipped the script on what he thought had to be done a certain sure. way. So. I, I love that concept uh, in terms of what you mentioned around hiring around fit and culture versus yeah. kind of the old school methodology, which has existed and still exists a lot more in the restaurant world. The business world, we t talk about a company like Google, we switched a long time ago where instead of looking at where somebody graduated or what their experience was, we were looking more about whether they're a fit, right? And you have folks who come in from all different backgrounds and study different things in undergrad and graduate school that have nothing to do with what we do at Google, but they're the right type of person. And that yeah. makes a huge difference Probably, versus just yeah. looking at a resume saying they've got 20 years experience, but they might be a jerk or they might yeah. be conceited yeah. or, or cocky or whatever yeah. it might be. And they when might you're open and you want to like learn Absolutely. and you want to help teach and you, yeah. your change doesn't scare you, I mean, it's, that's that's what it's about. Like, I mean, if change scared me, I would have never left Jersey. You know, I, I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't be here. This is. I love change. You know, I'm about to be 44 years old, and I'm just like, give me something new. You know, let's let's go. You know, I'm always down to. You know, I can learn something. Sure, let's go. I want to do it. You know, I literally talked to Jeremy the other day about going back to going back to school for meat science. He was just like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, let's go. I'm down. What? <laughs> Can I audit that? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. so there's, there's just, it, it's awesome. Yeah. It, it's in, in this kind of ecosystem that we've been talking about for the past 20 minutes or so. What's, what's the relationship then between an executive chef and a butcher? How do you guys work together? And, and let me also throw a side question in specifically for Walter. Um, so in 2017, Ryan was named. One of People Magazine's sexiest shows. <laughs> You're gonna bring this up. This is the worst PR ever. <laughs> so I, I sent him a list of questions yesterday. He and told I, me I not to say anything off. about that. I was like, hmm, where can so I, I work to this sneak in? That win. I had so people I like fun. harassing me in the dining because like our kitchen is very open. Yeah. There's a meat, meat display <laughs> case. Yeah. And, cat call. Oh yeah. Uh, just, did, like, I, I want to know. Did you did you notice a difference in him after that article came out as well? Yeah. So oh. the dynamic between you two Stands and, and a lot didn't change. Yeah. He stands a lot yeah. taller. He's like, you see me? <laughs> you know who I am, right? <laughs> He's screaming uh, all up. To like, yeah. you're, you're asking yeah. the question. Yeah. And totally I was just like, like, all right, yeah, no, I got, yeah. I got this one. We got a so, great answer. So now. the dynamic between uh, a butcher and a chef, uh, it, kind of the concept of the of prime and proper, and, and also the culture that you guys talked about as well. Sorry to throw things off there. Yeah, I had really, to throw like, that no, in there. I'm, I'm going home now. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, it go, it, it's the same as, as any other of the aspects of our kitchen. You know, we, I, I'm very much not the person that I've worked for chefs that, you know, this is how I want it done. This is my kitchen. This is my so-and-so. This is my dish or whatever. Like, none of that applies where we are. Um, you know, it's a collaborative effort between chefs to make a great experience for our guests. Um, you know, Walter and I just happen to have experiences that align fairly well. And, um, it's a constant kind of back and forth. Um, you know, we are gearing up to actually start running this week, uh, starting Wednesday. These are this really cool. It's like a uh, imagine like a porterhouse or like a T-bone steak. So it's got the fillet on one side, but then instead of having the New York strip on the other side, we actually have um, like a one-pound lobster tail that we like butter poach and then slice and then like laid it out. So it like looks like the section of the New York strip. And you know this is this is one of those things that Walter's kind of been like bugging me about and bugging me about, bugging me about. And finally, he just called our fish guy and was like, "Give me one of these lobster tails." And he put it up, and we're like, "All right, great." You know, like. And then one of our sous chefs looked at it and was like, 
he's been working on this really cool caviar beurre blanc, and he said, hey, why don't we put this, you know, because this caviar beurre blanc has a little bit of lobster in the base, like, let's put this on here, and it just kind of became, like, everybody just kind of builds on top of, like, you know, Walter and myself, you know, yeah, we're the final call on everything, but there's, everybody in the, in the, the restaurant kind of has a voice, um, you know, whether it's, you know, our, our prep team, service staff, like, you know, back of house management, like we all kind of just mm. bounce ideas off of each other constantly. And a lot of them start with jokes, um, <laughs> oddly enough, yeah. um, you know, and, and, you know, we kind of think about like, like I, I like to think about food as like, you know, it, it's all good, you know, there's no, there's no like, oh, well, this isn't the right fit at prime and proper, like we can't use that here, you know, like that's, that's, that's out the door. Um, you know, I didn't grow up eating the type of food that we serve. So I have this kind of weird background of, you know, just eating normal blue collar kind of stuff. So I always try and sneak those kind of things in. Um, and so like, perfect example, like our mac and cheese is made with evaporated milk and Velveeta as the base. And then we fold all these other great ingredients into it and use a really great pasta and, and you know, then level it up kind of that way. But, you know, it's, like I said, a lot, a lot of things will start off as a joke, but then, and then all of a sudden, Walter yeah. shows up with a one pound lobster tail and we're pouring like caviar beurre blanc on top of it. Yeah, so, man. Oh, it was, uh, it's odd, and it looks so looks good. Old. It does, it looks yeah. really cool. Yeah. If you go, if you go yeah. onto our social media, you'll see the picture of it, and it's just like, oh man, it's awesome. And it's so yeah. good, too. That's awesome. Walter, can you talk a little bit about kind of going back to um, kind of the meat side of things? Uh, talk about the process of sourcing, right? You talked about where some of your inspiration comes from growing up around butchers and, and uh, cheesemongers and things like that. What is your process here now in Detroit? What you take a lot of pride in the type of meat that you bring yep. in from, from start to finish. What does that look like for you from, so, from sourcing to bringing in? Sourcing is so important, uh, especially when you're talking about like fine dining and, and what I do. And it's all about relationships. And I've had the same relationship with uh, the gentleman I buy beef from now. We've known each other 20 plus years. And uh, I've been buying from him probably the same amount of time. And uh, he's one of the largest beef buyers there is in the nation. So when you have that much pull in the beef business, you get, you get first pick of everything, you know, and it's so important that, uh, that I'm getting the same quality 52 weeks of the year. Like it's so important. Consistency for me is key. You know, it's key for what we're building here. You know, you want consistency. You want something that's going to last 30 years, 40 years, 50 years something that's not gonna change. It's gonna be, you know, you may only come eat with us once a year, but that once a year, that steak's gonna be the same. And meat is also seasonal. Like right now is the best time to buy beef because it's marbled. So summertime is the hardest time for my guy to buy beef for me. Uh, so we do, he sources, him and his guy source all throughout the Midwest, you know, and they're dealing with the best ranchers you're gonna find. You're dealing, they're dealing with ranchers that you know, these guys are meat scientists and, and you go out and you see them and they look like cowboys, you know, so, but these guys know more about everything, you know, they know about the genetics of the animal. They want to make sure that those genetics are the right genetics. You know, my guy also knows that I'm not buying Angus, you know, so it's a little bit more difficult when I'm not buying Angus, you know, he's looking for Hereford. He's looking for guys that care more about those animals than anything. So regardless if he's buying it from Idaho or Colorado, where he's buying it from, he's buying it from the right people. You know, he's buying it from those guys that are going, listen, you know, I know my genetics, I know my feed, I know the pastures that these animals are being raised in, I know everything about them. And that's so important to me because I need to make sure that when you come to eat, you're gonna be getting the best. You know, granted may not be coming from Michigan, but maybe none of the guys around here are going to be able to supply me with what I need, you know, what the public needs, because it's not really so much about me or Ryan, it's about the brand. We need to make sure that that brand gets the best possible product that you're going to find anywhere in the nation, you know, and I'd rather be the guy to be, that gets that, you know, than someone else. I'd rather have you guys here in Detroit be like, man, we're, we're getting the best beef in the nation. You know, it's all grass fed, pasture raised, you know, and it, it, there's a huge misconception when people are like, oh, but it's corn fed or, you know, corn finished. And I'm like, yeah, it's corn finished, but it's it's not what you think it is. A lot of people have this misconception that 
these guys are just walking with big bags of corn and dumping them in the troughs and these animals are eating big bags of corn. It's not, it's, if you actually look at the feed from every single feed lot, there's more grass in there than corn. As a matter of fact, on my Instagram page, what was that, a year? Well over a year ago, yeah. A little year and a half ago, maybe. Uh, we went to the Tiffany Cattle Company in Kansas. And uh, it was great because I was there to actually like take pictures and see see their feed operation. And you actually look at the feed that these animals are on, and it's mostly grasses. You know, it's going to be grasses, barley. There's going to be grains. There's going to be some corn in there, but there's mo mainly grasses. You know, so everybody's like, "Ah, oh, corn fed's bad." And it's, no, it's not. Corn fed is great. There's nothing wrong with corn fed beef. You know, I get people tell me all the time, they're like, oh, I only eat grass-fed beef. And I'm like, well, that's great because all beef in the entire world is grass-fed. You know, it's like, what is it finished? And then people are like, I don't know, what are you talking about? And it's like, you know, if you've ever had grass-finished beef, it's, uh, it's very earthy. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's something else. <laughs> you know, so most of the time when people are eating beef, it's, it's going to be grain-finished beef. And grain finished beef is where you're gonna get that sweet, beautiful flavor. You're gonna get that beautiful intramuscular fat uh, and the textures, the flavors is everything, you know. And once again, this is gonna be ranchers that are actually care about these animals. You know, the, the more you care about these animals, the more it's gonna be worth to them in the end, you know. So they don't wanna, they don't want sick animals. They want super healthy animals. They want them to eat the best food possible because the more yield that they can get off of these animals, the more money they're worth to them, so. Hopefully Walter, that, uh, <laughs> Walter's got 66,000 Instagram followers in case anyone's uh, interested in joining in. I suggest the follow. Um, you talk about consistency, right, mm -hmm. with the type of beef that you source. Um, can you talk a little bit more, and you, you just, you, you delved into it just a little bit, but this concept of sustainability as well, because that's an important topic when it comes to any food sourcing, meat in particular right now. Um, what, what are your thoughts on kind of sustainability and how that plays into to what you're looking at as well? It's... You know, I, it, it's a little bit tough because everybody's like, oh, well, you should buy local, you know, and, and I agree. I, I love the concept of local, but uh, to be brutally honest, you know, you're not going to find what we need in just one or two farms, you know, so sustainability. I mean, it's, it, ah, man, it's difficult to, to answer this question. Uh, because it has to come from all over the Midwest. You know, it's not coming from one farm, it's not coming from two farms. You know, it's coming from multiple farms because maybe maybe this rancher only has 200 head, but guess what, out of that 200 head, only one of them is gonna be up to my standards. You know, so it's gonna be, yeah, man, that's tough. <laughs> it's, I think more along the lines of like, the way that we source cattle, or the way that we source beef rather is you know, is to we find the best of the best of the best, um, and I think that as you know, as farms transition, like Walter was saying, like they want to be, they want these cattle to be as healthy as possible. They don't, they're not feeding them a bunch of antibiotics and all this crazy stuff just just because it yeah. oh, will raise it and then slaughter it. Whatever they want them to be healthy, they want them to grow at at a healthy rate for that animal, and it's sustainable to as these farms become more sustainable. Um, and as the meat industry kind of transitions in that direction, um, the the level of quality may change a bit. Like he's saying, like you know, out of a, a farm that has 200 head of cattle, only one of them might be up to our standards. Um, so that the level of quality may drop a little bit um, as things become more sustainable. But you know, that's just the nature yeah. of, of of the beast. What about, um, Walter, you talked a little bit about um, grass-fed versus corn-fed, some of the misperceptions there. What are, what are some other misperceptions or common misperceptions that you hear about the meat industry um, as well today? Oh, man, I hear people like, oh, you buy from a large packing house. You know, it's like, oh, well, I only buy from this small guy that, you know, they take the animal in the back and you don't see what happens. And it's like, it's like okay, that's, that's great, you know. In the meantime, you look at, you look at IBP, one of the largest packing houses there is. Uh, you know they care so much. Uh, what was her? What's her name? Uh, uh, Temple. Oh shit! What's her name? Temple something. Can never remember her name. 
she's a, she's huge into uh, the way animals are, are are harvested. And if you look at these huge packing plants, like IBP, you know, these animals are brought into to the finishing pens, and they're only filled about seventy percent full. Uh, they're 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 they have these misters on, so there's cold water, so it keeps the animal super calm and relaxed. Uh, there's no stun guns. There's no tasers. You know, they 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 literally these guys walk around with hefty black garbage bags full of air on long rods and they just move them just to get the animals moving so when it's time for them to be uh to be knocked and knocking is when the piston is driven into the brain to sever everything uh they're actually brought into single file and the walls are really high so they don't see people uh and they're they're brought in individually you know no one they can't see what's going on in front of them and it's a whole comfort thing they have no idea what's going on and then before you know it, it's over. And you want something like that. You want that because the less stress there's on the animal, the better the meat's gonna be. You know, when you're talking about a lot of these smaller, small time guys, and I know a lot of the guys too, you know, they'll get up there on their tractor with their 22 and they're just like trying to wrangle up this animal and he's just like stressed out because they don't know what's going on. And then next thing you know, there's just like a boom and then the animal's down and it's like, well, you just stressed out this entire animal. You know, compared to like IBP and those guys where there's vets on premises, they're looking at every single animal. You know, the USDA guys are constantly inspecting every single animal. You know, they're, they're trying to utilize everything. They need to make sure these animals are healthiest that they can be, the cleanest they can be. You know, you bruise an animal when you harvest the animal, there's a huge section of loss and that's loss. And I hate to say it, but when it comes down to it, it's about money. You know, they want to make as much money as possible. So the cleaner the animals are, the healthier the animals are, the, 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 the cleaner the animals are harvested, you know, you're going to have a much usable product, which is going to be game for them. So there, there's a lot of people like, you know, oh, you buy from IVP and it's like, yeah, look at the, look at the meat. You know, these are people that they trust in their company. They trust in their workers. You know, they, they trust in their vets. They, they hire vets that they don't even need to hire. You know, so, and you, you talk, take a look at small town guys, a lot of them can't afford to, you know, unfortunately. You know, there's some, now don't get me wrong, I've had plenty of small time farms that were, produce great stuff, you know, but the masses that I need and masses that a lot of other restaurants need, it just, you won't be able to supply us. Uh, I, again, I mentioned I grew up on a dairy farm talking about uh, animal comfort. Uh, I often joke that they live a pretty darn good life there. They've oh, got, yeah. they sleep on these like, nice air mattresses <laughs> uh they have misters year round oh, yeah. they've got you know heating got units heating, heated mattresses they listen to music yeah. uh these cows seem pretty chill every oh, time yeah. i see them and uh, you know and that's that's a whole too. other thing too with being grown up on a on a dairy farm you know a lot of people are like they'll say oh you know how do you feel about veal you know and i'm like i love veal and they're like how can you eat a baby and I'm like, okay, here we go. You know, I'm like, it's on, you know, and then I tell people, I'm like, you need to understand dairy farmers need to keep their cows pregnant, keep producing meat, keep producing milk, not meat, milk. You know, if they birth a male, you're not going to be able to milk a male. You know, what else are you going to do with it? You know, so it's not like it's, it's a horrible thing. They just don't have a place to put a male dairy cow. You know, I don't know what were you guys raising jerseys, Holsteins. Uh, Holsteins. You know, and there's not really a big call for, for Holstein meat, you know, so it's, uh, it, it goes to a great place. You know, it's not like it's, uh, it's not, it's just, it, it's just a touchy subject. A lot of people don't like to talk about it, but veal's amazing. I'm also from Jersey, so you grow up on veal, you know, it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure you probably heard a lot about it growing up, you know, it's like, ooh, yeah. we don't want to talk about this. Well, we, we talk a lot about sustainability in the milk industry as, as well, because okay. there's a lot of alternatives um, that uh, can be good or some that lack a lot of the health aspects of actual real animal milk. And so you talk about sustainability when it comes to that as well. And the other part of that is a lot as folks look towards other alternatives to dairy milk, um, a lot of small to medium dairy farmers are going out of business. You know, there used to Which be a shame. hundreds of thousands of dairy farmers around America. And now they're in the, in the thousands. Um, and when they all go out of business, if that's what it comes to with low milk prices, 
than what happens. And, and there's some of the same concerns within the meat industry yeah. as well, I know. So this idea of sustainability, I think, is really interesting, is. especially as it pertains to what yeah. your knowledge or where your knowledge lies. It, it definitely vary. I mean, you know, also with, with going back to feed, you know, like I said, all, all cattle is, is grass fed, you know, all of it, you know, and like right now in Kansas, they're having an issue with a uh, lack of rain. So they're not actually being able to, to graze off of grasses because there aren't any because of the weather. And it's, this isn't the first time, this isn't the last time it's happened over and over. Uh, they depend on a lot of guys. I believe most of them are in Idaho and they grow alfalfa and they grow barley, they grow a bunch of stuff and they actually make pellets that are actually sold to all these farmers, uh, like in Kansas right now. So if you look at a lot of the cattle, they're eating all these great natural pellets, you know, and a lot of that is, is actually wind up healthier than just grazing off of grasses, which is really, really nice. Let's, uh, let's pull things back to Detroit. Um, you know, we're obviously huge fans of the city. Uh, yes. Google just recently moved downtown and we're, we're very excited to be down here. Um, you guys are a staple now of the downtown dining and, and experience industry. What do you guys see uh, over the next one or two years for downtown Detroit and how you guys will fit into that? <laughs> Man, I like it's one of the things, and I know it's kind of a thing in, in every industry, but uh, you know, sort of the skilled labor, like not necessarily having people that are really here um, that are dedicated to, to this industry. We're lucky because we're staffed with people that this is what they do. Nobody, nobody that works in private proper is just there because they get a paycheck. They're there because they're either a great server or they're you know somebody that wants to work in the kitchen and really learn everything they can. Um, there's restaurants opening every 20 minutes pretty much downtown. It's yeah, crazy. It's crazy. Um, I mean, it's, and it's kind of interesting for me having been in this market my entire life and my entire career. Um, seeing how it's changed now. You know, you have chefs coming from Chicago, you have butchers coming from Florida. Um, you know, we have- uh, Not from Florida. Our, <laughs> <laughs> coming from Jersey. Yeah. Via, Jersey, via, via, Florida, via Florida, Florida, via, via Florida, Florida City. Clarify that. But, you know- um, Sorry to our Florida watchers. It's a <laughs> beautiful state. <laughs> My wife's from Florida, so that's a, you know. <laughs> but you, uh, we, we have all these, you know, all these people kind of coming into the city and, and just seeing the way that not just the downtown area is changing, but like the culinary scene in the city is, you know, we, we've had a lot of good people here for a long time and now it's expanding and the demand is growing every, you know, every day. Um, and one, one of the cool things that I'm seeing a, a rise in that is supporting all of the restaurants that are opening is uh, there's a lot of great purveyors that are sort of popping up from seemingly nowhere. Um, you know, that's kind of been one of been one of my gripes with this market for my whole career is, is getting the level of beef that Walter brings or getting, you know, the level of, of seafood or getting, you know, all these things yes. that you can get in larger markets, New York, Chicago, like, um, and finally having people that are like, hey, there's all these restaurants in Detroit, I'm going to open up my own, you know, seafood company. Um, I'm going to start delivering truffles door to door and you can, you know, pick and choose the ones that you want. And, you it's know, awesome to see them come in, by yeah. the way. Oh, it's crazy. We, we had in, a little cooler uh, full of truffles. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> we had in, uh, last year, we had uh, Recovery Park Farms in as well. So you've got yeah. sourcing of, like, you've got some urban farms and things like that in the area that, are, that have been around for a while, but that are also sourcing very locally as well in terms of vegetables and produce and things oh, like yeah. that. Oh, mm yeah. -hmm. I mean, we deal with a, a good friend of mine I actually met via Instagram, uh, Eric. I wish I knew how to say his last name. Uh, Shevchenko or something? Yes. I yeah. I, well, it's, he's a good dude. He's out of. He's actually from here, moved to California. He was in California for God knows how long. Uh, he worked with really close with Thomas Keller, developed poultry for Thomas Keller and the French Laundry, you know. And I didn't know that he was from here. And then he sent me a message, and he's like, "Holy shit, Walter, you're in Detroit? I'm moving back to Detroit." And I'm like, "What do you mean back?" And then he's like, "I'm from the area." And then next thing we know, he's back in the area and he's raising, uh, like I told Ryan, I'm like, listen, this guy's here and we need to talk to him. And he came in and just was like, brought us rabbits and brought us chickens. And now he's raising, uh, he's raising hogs. Berkshire hogs. Yeah, yeah, Berkshire hogs. And like, he's one of those, he's one of those ranchers that I talked about earlier that really dives super deep into everything. 
like he's just not getting them to raise them. He's making sure that where he's raising them is going to be right. You know, it's, it's all about where they're, where they're going to live and what they're going to forage, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what's the weather like. And like Eric really goes deep. So it was great that we've dealt with him for, we did a rabbit dinner with him. We did uh, our Thanksgiving chickens with him. Yeah, when we did, uh, when we did James, the James Beard dinner last August, um, he gave us these really, really nice poussins. Um, there's like little tiny chickens. And we made these really nice galantines with them and the flavor on them is just like absolutely incredible. But that's kind of like, Still you're asking right about people. like, yeah, the different yeah. different farms and different purveyors and like sort of sourcing locally. It's like that local sustainable in the same conversation as the consistency is always a tough one, especially for us. Like we're, right. yeah, like we're, you know, we're talking about a steakhouse that we want to become an institution that, you know, while we have sustainability and, and you know, sourcing locally in mind as much as possible, you know, like he was saying, like if somebody comes in once a year, they have, we got to make sure that that's, you know, hitting the nail on the head. Yeah. You can, you and know, it's not about a year or two years. Like I said, it's, I'm, I'm looking farther, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you know, why are we, you know, we should be that institution that, you know, hundred years from now, people are like, you know, when they talk about great steakhouses, it's like, man, we've been talking about this steakhouse for 90 years. You know, and it's like, this is someplace you need to go. Just, you know, just like Peter Luger's, Keens, you know, the big boys. And it, it's right where we're at. I mean, we're in an amazing city that's exploding, which is awesome. I couldn't ask to be in a better city. And I've worked all over the world. And this is just awesome. It's amazing to be part of it. And then I want to make sure that what standards Ryan and I set now are going to be the same standards that are going to be 40 years down the road. Yeah. You know, people are, regardless if you're buying it local here or if you have to source out outside of the Michigan area, you know, while it's, while it's not right here now, it may be right later, you know, so. And, and we're happy to have you guys in Detroit. You know, there's, there's been steakhouses in Detroit, but you guys have certainly taken it to another level, right? And it's so interesting hearing you guys talk. You talk about uh, consistency, sustainability, culture, uh, all of these different things. Um, you're not uh, a restaurant that's looking to be around for one or two years and ride a trend. You guys are, are here for a long time, which I think is really interesting. And that's what we like to see in Detroit as well, as folks who kind of plant their feet, um, kind of come up with something interesting and something a little bit different. And again, the experiential part is really interesting as well. So we're, we're very stoked to have you guys around. Um, I'll leave on one question I read that the Golden State Warriors swung through and shut down the restaurant was <laughs> about a week and a half ago. So yeah. if, you, if you want to become an institution, that's a good way to do it is have visiting professional sports teams shut the restaurant down, especially, oh, yeah, I mean, man. where, where they, they lost, first of all, the Pistons were able to pick them off. But uh, what, what was that process like for you guys? Any good stories you can share? I with know us? the next day I came in and I was like, I looked at my Japanese Miyazaka and I'm like, I left and it was this big, and I come back and it's this big, and I'm like, what happened? And they're like, wow, one of the guys wanted, you know, a whole steak, and I'm like, what? I'm like, first of all, it's gross. I'm like, that's just so rich and so, like, there's a lot. There's a reason why we cut them into three and six ounces, and they're like, no, he wanted a whole steak, and I'm like, are you serious? So you just cut a 21-ounce steak, you know, of Japanese Miyazaki Wagyu? I'm like, oh, all right, man, if that's what they want to do, and then that's what they want to do. They can afford it, right? Yeah, you know? I mean, that was, that was what I walked into the next day, and I just was like, it's, that's a lot. Yeah, I'm good for, like, an ounce to two ounces, and I'm like, I'm done. As much as we, you know, talk about, you know, like, you know, being consistent, being this great place, like, it's also we kind of wanted to be one of those places where people could just come and just, like, ball out and just go crazy <laughs> and, like, you know, put Crab Oscar on top of whatever, <laughs> white truffles, and just, like, go crazy with it. I mean, the last couple of times Walter's had some some friends of his in, we've made, like, these insane, like, meat platters with, you know, burgers and, you know, dry aged fillets and, like, bits of ribeye and, like, bone marrow with, like, braised short rib in them. And, like, here comes this big, giant, like, copper, you know, platter just covered in meat. So. Meat, sweat, heaven. Yeah. If you ever need a taste tester, just uh, give me a shot. Literally, I, I could be to your restaurant in about 10 minutes. All right, I'll hop on a <laughs> You hop bring on a bourbon, bro. Yeah, I got I'll plenty of meat. Over. We yeah. have a lot more than beef <laughs> jerky there. So. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming in. Super uh -huh. interesting. We wish you the best of luck. Like I said, we're, we're excited to have you guys in the city of Detroit. We love what you guys are doing, and, and it's awesome to kind of hear some of the story behind Prime and Proper as well. So thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for having me.